have you open your Bible with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've already read this chapter, and so we have a little bit of familiarity with it. While you're turning there, I just want to share the title. What, what is it that motivates you? What motivates you? For example, what does it take for you to get yourself a snack? What does it take for you to search Amazon or go and buy the stuff that you want? What does it take to get you to watch sports or TV or a movie? What does it take to get you to spend time with the people that you like? And of course, the answer to all of the above and more is that probably not much at all because of the good feelings that it brings to you when you have that opportunity. That being said, what is it that motivates you spiritually? Are you motivated spiritually at all? I mean, what would motivate you to live for God? What would motivate you to serve God? What is it that moves you as a believer? If you are a believer, what moves you as a Christian? Well, what I see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is that despite minimal earthly rewards, facing great danger, really staring death in the face, the apostle and his mission team have an incredible, strong motivation to do the will of God, to serve the Lord, to live for him. How does that happen? Well, I think there are two main things in this chapter that I want to point out this morning that really account for the proper motivation, really being motivated as a believer. The first one is found in, in the first half, the first 13 verses. I call it destination living. That is the future hope that we have. And the second motivation, I call it representation living. By that I mean the fact that we represent Jesus. We are called, in verse 20 of this chapter, ambassadors for Christ. And so there are two major motivations for living for God and serving the Lord. The future hope that we have as believers and who we represent, the loving Christ that we've been singing about, that have you been listening or thinking about the words of the songs that we've sung? We've not really been singing about how God loves us, but we've been singing about how we love God. And it is the love of Christ that really is a motivating factor for being a proper representative of his. So I want us to pause a moment. Let's pray briefly and then look at these verses as we go down as quickly as we can through this chapter. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. We could never match all that you have done for us. But Lord, we are eternally grateful. And because of our gratitude to you, we simply say, oh Lord, what would you have us to do? What can we do? to bring you honor, to bring you glory. Use this passage of scripture this morning to truly minister to our heart, to work your will in our lives. Thank you that we don't have to wonder. It's all written down here for us in the scripture, in the Bible. The word of the living God, may it be like that spiritual sword of the spirit that divides us under, that cuts between the joint and marrow, the soul and the spirit, down to lay bare before you the very thoughts and motives of our heart. You know them already, but Lord, show us. And I pray that you'll get glory then through these lives. That's all we exist for. 
to live for you, to bring you the honor that is due your name. And Lord, that's how we get blessed. As a fringe, we thank you for that. And ask that, uh, again, you'd be exalted in Jesus' name. We pray it. Amen. So I want to look at uh, what he says here. And I have to remind you that uh, Paul is living as a person that has been completely convinced that this present life is not all there is. Are you convinced of that? That there's more to life than what you can see. That there is an unseen realm. That there is a future that awaits us after physical death. There is another dimension. Paul is a man that is convinced he's the writer of this, uh, of this letter that we're reading. He's convinced he believes God's truth concerning the future. I don't know how much you believe what God has said about the future, but it's fascinating what we read here. And one of the things that he says is that we have a future eternal destination. And that's what we should be living for. Our lives need to be focused on a destination that is other than the here and now, a future hope that we have. Remember what he said back in verse 7 of chapter 4? He said our bodies are like fragile clay jars or pots. In fact, he said as we go through this life living for Jesus and ministering for him, he says uh, that the dying of Jesus is appears in our bodies. He says death works in us. He says uh, uh, we're always delivered unto death. This is all chapter 4. In fact, he says in verse 16 of that same chapter, our outward man, meaning our body, is perishing. <laughs> I'm speaking to all of you, and all of us are perishing in the process of dying. <laughs> That's the reality of, of things. And so then it's no wonder why he begins, because unfortunately there's a, there's a chapter division between four and five, but it's not in the original writing of this letter. That's why he says what he does in the next verse, in chapter five, verse one. We know that our earthly house, meaning our human body, of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What's he talking about? Destination living is a hope that pertains, first of all, to our human body. There is hope for this human body, according to the first eight verses. He is saying that this cracked pot called a human body it's wasting away see in verse one he calls it a tabernacle the word actually means a tent now i know we're city slickers but uh have you ever done any camp uh camping and camped in a tent have you done any tent camping a few of you have all right well tent camping is uh is what you need to think of here because that's what we're in now. Our bodies are like tents. And if you've ever done any camping in a tent, you know that tents are easily dismantled. By the way, we're told in Acts chapter 18 that Paul made tents to supplement his income. He was a tent maker. So he knew what he was talking about. And he says our bodies are like tents that are easily pitched and easily taken down easily dismantled. Our bodies are falling apart. You might think you're pretty healthy. You might be a picture of health, but give it a few years and you will come to realize that your body is in the process of disintegration and dying. And that's what he says. We're in the dying process. This earthly house, this tent is being dissolved. It's, dis it's disintegrating. And you know what, folks? That's why you shouldn't make your body your focus. 
Now, I'm all for eating healthy. I'm all for uh, proper exercise. But remember, this same writer says that bodily exercise profits little because it's only short-lived. And so we should not focus on our human body. We should rather focus on the real you. You should focus on the spiritual, immaterial part of your being. We are tent dwellers. This body is a tent. You know what that makes us? That makes us campers. We're all campers on this earth. We're really just pilgrims. That is, we're not permanent residents here. We're passing through. We're on a journey. And that journey has a destination. It either has a destination of a glorious heaven or an awful hell. But we are pilgrims on a journey with bodies that are likened to simple tents. And that is then the perspective that Paul wants us to get here because he says in, in that first verse, but it's okay because when this tent gets taken down, when it gets dismantled in physical death, it's okay because believers have a house a structure, not a tent, a structure that is eternal in the heavens. He's not talking about the mansion. He's not talking about the room. He's talking about your human body is going to be replaced with a permanent body. A resurrection body is what he's referring to. And if you want to look at it any closer, don't do it now. But 1 Corinthians 15 gives a great uh, understanding of a future resurrection body. It's a time, he says in verse 2, in this tent that we live in, we groan. <laughs> We're burdened. It, it, uh, we have our, our, our groanings. There's, there's afflictions, not just physical bodily afflictions. We have mental afflictions. We have emotional afflictions, all kinds of afflictions. He says that's why we groan in these tents, in this body. And we earn, as, as believers, we earnestly desire to be clothed with that permanent structure, that house, which is from heaven. Because, verse 3, if so be that being clothed, having that permanent body, we would not be found naked, that is, disembodied. Verse 4, for we that are in this tent, this tabernacle, we groan. Okay, he repeats what he said in verse 2. We groan. We're burdened. But we're burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, that we would be disembodied, just rid of this body so we'd be a spirit, but rather that we would we groan to be clothed with, with a permanent body, that our death, our mortality would be swallowed up by life that's eternal, an eternal body. What's he saying? He's saying there's coming a day when believers will have all the affliction that they suffered replaced with joy and blessing in the future. And so I like what he says here. He says that we want this new body because we don't want to be disembodied. You know, when God made human beings, he made them with human bodies. God intends human beings to have bodies. And that's why we will not, after this life is passed, that's why we will not be simply spirits floating around in, uh, in the sky somewhere. We will be people with new resurrection bodies like Jesus rose in that uh, will last forever, that will never get sick, will never die, will not suffer affliction will not groan like we groan now in these bodies. But I can't be dogmatic about this, but just reading between the lines, it's possible. It's possible that not when a, when a believer dies, that they may get an intermediate body before the resurrection body that's permanent. For instance, you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two people that appeared, Moses and Elijah, that appeared in a body. 
And I also think in Revelation chapter 6, there are believers that are martyred during the tribulation period, that, that great uh, that, that period of Jacob's trouble. They're, they're martyred, and yet they are pictured as being clothed in white robes. They have a body clothed in white robes. So it's possible that the moment a, a, a believer dies and is present with the Lord, it it's possible that there is an intermediate body because God hasn't created us to be disembodied spirits. But what we know, what Paul is saying here for sure, is that we are going to be given a new body. That's our future hope regarding our body. And I think what Paul's talking about here is what he talked about in First Thessalonians chapter 4. I think he's looking forward to being raptured. I think he's talking about that uh, when Christ comes and uh, he's going to raise the dead in Christ first and then people that are alive when he comes will be raised up with a new resurrection body to meet him in the, in the air having not passed through that valley of the shadow of death. You say, this hope, is there any guarantee? Well, look at verse 5. Here it is. Now, he that's given us this hope, who wrought us for this safe, the same self same thing, is God, and he's given unto us the earnest of this. If you're a believer, you know this. You are permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Your human spirit is occupied by the third person of the Trinity the Holy Spirit of God. He indwells you, and as a result, you become a partaker of the divine nature, we're told. And the Holy Spirit's indwelling the believer is, as verse 5 says, is the down payment. It's the guarantee that God is going to resurrect your body, give you a new resurrection body in the future. The fact that believers are spirit in dwell is guaranteed a resurrection body. That's what this verse is teaching us. The spirit of God in the believer is God's deposit, God's down payment, God's earnest money, you might say. I understand that that uh, particular word in our New Testament in modern Greek refers to an engagement ring. When a person gives, uh, when a guy gives a girl an, an engagement ring, it's, uh, it's like a guarantee. doesn't always work out, I understand. It's, it's a guarantee that, yes, I'm choosing you. I, I'm going to marry you. Well, the Holy Spirit is God's engagement ring, and God doesn't break his engagements like people do. And so it's God's down payment of a, future resurrection body. This is encouraging. That's why he says in verse 6, therefore we're always confident, we're always encouraged, because we know that while we are at home in this body, while we are living in this human body, this physical body, we're absent from the Lord, obviously. We're not with him in heaven. But that's okay, because verse 7 says, we can see the unseen. We walk by faith, not by sight. With the eye of faith, we can believe and we can see that there is an unseen realm and there is a resurrection body awaiting us, guaranteed by the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Verse 8, we're encouraged. We're confident. I say we're willing rather to be absent from the body I'm willing to die a physical death because that's going to usher me into the presence of the Lord. That's what he's saying here. And what he means is in our present state, which is a temporary, just a tent dwelling, we're just camping. We're not home yet. Our future home, our house, is a permanent, eternal body and what Paul is saying in that eighth verse is not some morbid death wish that he has, but he's really expressing a, it's a, a triumphant express, expression of the ultimate reality that 
this life isn't all there is. And that this life is going to be followed with a better life. And that this body is going to be replaced by a glorious body like Jesus's. You know, it's fun to travel. But if you travel too much, eventually you get homesick. And when you get back home, you're glad to be back home. We're travelers. We're traveling this earth. We're on a journey. But one day we're going to be really home. We're going to be with the Lord. I remember my dad's last days in the hospice before he went to be with the Lord uh, from cancer. Just speaking with him about things and him saying at one point, he said, I just want to go home. And I knew what he meant, but I tested him. I said, oh, you want to go home too? And I named the address. He said, no, no, I want to go home to be with the Lord. I want to go to my eternal home is what he meant. And not too, not, not too long after that, he did. Destination living. It's a hope regarding the human body that is replaced by a resurrection body. But it not only this destination living, this hope not only encompasses a body, but it, it encompasses accountability. Now, here's where it gets a little dicey. This is something that you might not want to think about, but we need to think about it. It's here. In verse 9 and 10, he says, Wherefore we labor, we serve the Lord, that whether we are present with the Lord in heaven or absent from the Lord here on this earth, we serve the Lord to be accepted or to be pleasing to him. It's our desire. It's our goal to please God, whether we're, we're here or there. We want to please God. And here's why. Because guess what? Every single believer will face a point of accountability. Whether you're a pastor like me or just someone sitting in the audience like you or listening, every believer must give an account. Verse 10 says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us may receive the things done in his body, whether it, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or actually the word bad means worthless. This is not what is called the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, which is a judgment that all lost people will stand before the throne of God. This is a judgment for believers after they go to be with the Lord. In fact, the judgment seat is the word bima and in corinth i've been to corinth and i saw the archaeological excavation of the bima in corinth and that is simply a platform where the city magistrates would uh, give forth judgments people would be brought before them it's like a court of law the bima and so paul uses that word to talk about the believer's personal accountability before God, that uh, because of the ultimate reality that we are going to stand before the Lord, it, we are motivated to please God and, and not ourselves. What would motivate us to please God? Well, that I'm not going to be judged by people. One day as a believer, my ministry, my life is going to be judged by the Lord. And when he does that, all the secrets are going to be revealed. That is, all my real motives and attitudes will be made known. And all of my service for the Lord is either going to be approved or it's going to be said worthless. And that's why he says in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror or the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. What he means by terror, or what does it mean to fear the Lord? I used to think that fearing the Lord was that you fear him taking that big stick and, and knocking you out with it. But that's not how I understand the fear of the Lord now. I understand the fear of the Lord as not him hurting me, but me hurting him. 
that I love him so much, I don't want to do anything to hurt him. And knowing that, having that kind of fear of the Lord, this awesome God who is going to evaluate all the motives of my life ministry, that's what motivates me to want to please him. Look at verse 12. We commend, we don't approve uh, ourselves again unto you. We're not trying to build up ourselves before you to give you an occasion to boast about us. He says in verse 13, whether you think we're insane or not, it's pleasing God that what is what matters. It's for your cause. And what he is saying is simply this. I'm not worrying about your human evaluation of me. I'm concerned about God's evaluation. And God's evaluation will not only be good for me, but if, I, if my works are approved of him, it'll be beneficial for you too. Did you know that pastors are gonna, gonna give an account for their people? Yeah, Hebrews chapter 13, pretty scary, right? I'm gonna answer for you too. Spiritual leaders are gonna answer for their people as well as their own ministry. Destination living. It has to do with the hope that we have regarding a body and also that accountability that we'll give before the judgment seat of Christ. Now down in uh, verse 14 to the rest of the chapter, I call that representation living. And the key word there is love. In fact, in verse 14, look at how he puts it. For the love of Christ constraineth us or compels us because we judge that if one died for all and all were dead and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again god is at the center of human life not only Am I motivated to live for God and serve God because I have a future hope? But because I currently am in a loving relationship with Jesus. If you're a believer, you represent Jesus, whose love compels you to do what you do for him. The love of Christ, he said, constrains me. Think of it this way. Jesus exited heaven, and he offered himself as a sacrifice. And he surrounds his people then and, and, and conquers his people with that kind of selfless, sacrificial love. And Paul says it's that love that Christ demonstrated and continues to shower upon me that constantly grips me and hems me in. That's what the word constraineth means. It holds me and hems me in and causes me to express that same selfless abandonment to God. You know why? Because literally, literally speaking, believers are joined to Jesus, spirit to spirit, Believers are joined to Jesus, and as a result, that love of Jesus is just profusely diffused throughout your entire heart. That's what Romans 5.5 5 says. It says the love of God is shed abroad in the heart of believers. When he says the love of Christ constrains me, he's not talking about his love for Jesus. He's talking about Jesus' love for him. But may I remind you that because he loves us, we love him, that our love is reciprocal, that it is the love of Christ that we get a grip of, that we get an understanding of, which is immeasurable. It's boundless love. But when we understand something of it, it grips us so much that our hearts then are filled with a sense of God's love for us, and that's what compels, that's what drives, that's what motivates believers to live for Jesus and do his will, serve him. That's what he's saying. And, and when we do so, when we are joined to Jesus, not only is his love just shed abroad in our hearts, but notice this. 
it, it, it says in verse 14 that uh, we died with him. If one died for all, then we're all dead. Verse 15, and he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose. Jesus died for us and rose again for us. But the truth of the matter is, we also as believers spiritually, literally, but spiritually died with him and rose again with him. That's talking about our identity, an identity that you need to know about if you're a believer, that you spiritually experienced a death and resurrection with him and in him. That's what verse 15 is telling us. And when that happened, that produced a total and, and uh, uh, a total spiritual internal change that absolutely reorients your whole life. Have you experienced that? If you're saved, you have undergone an inward change that has completely reoriented your whole human life. How? Verse 15 tells us very clearly, you no longer live a self-centered life. Now you live a Christ-centered human life. Your life has been totally reoriented. It's a complete change inwardly. And that's why you see people differently. You see people from a, a completely different viewpoint, he says in verse 16. You don't see them as whoever, you know, that's why we get convicted when we have ill feelings toward people. And, and then the Holy Spirit gives us his viewpoint of those people. And then we, well, that self, I got, it's got to be Christ, not self. Verse 15, I want you to see this. This is very important. This is really at the heart of what representation living is about. Verse 15 is basically, again, saying this. There has been a total reorientation of human life in the believing heart. An inward change so radical, so complete, that uh, you no longer live for yourself, but you live for Jesus. And really, that is an explanation of that famous Bible verse 17, two verses down, where we've read, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. He's made new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are... What is old that's passed away? You're no longer living for yourself. What is new that has come? You're now living for Christ. You've been reoriented inwardly. Verse 15 is ex explains verse 17. You're not living a self-centered, but a Christ-centered life is what it means. Very important that you understand this because it's all about a right relationship. You know, most of our problems in life are relationship problems. Think about it. Most of our problems are relationship problems. That's what the cross was about. The cross deals with the most important relationship that any human being can have, and that is a relationship with God. It's at the cross where our relationship with God, a bridge was built by him so that we can cross into a personal saving relation. The most basic and important relationship has already been taken care of by Jesus when he sacrificed himself selflessly as your substitute instead of you in your place on that cross. And that potentially is the fix for all other relationships that we have with people. If you have that relationship with him. Paul's talking about ministry in verses 18 to 21, serving the Lord. And you know what it really comes down to? Look at it. He says, all things are of God. God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. 
he, that's the cross again. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The reconciliation has already been accomplished. God did that on that tree. Now he has handed over to us the message and the ministry of what he did to make reconciliation for us on that cross. He's given us the ministry. And you know what it amounts to? Again, not living for yourself, but living for others. That's what ministry is. It's not worrying about yourself, but it's your concern for others. That uh, you see others saved through the reconciliation that God made on our behalf that you have taken advantage of, that you want others to be able to take advantage of. The word reconciliation, see it there in those verses. The English word is actually from the Latin, from the Latin re, which means back, and the Latin conciliare, which means to bring together. So, the English word means to bring back together. That is to restore a previously broken relationship. The word reconcile, it implies the original intention of God was that we would have a God-centered life in relationship to him when he made human beings. But you know the story of humanity, right? What happened in that Garden of Eden that gets perpetrated to all human beings after is that human beings made a choice because God made humans with the ability to choose. Human beings made a faithful choice, and that choice was they chose themselves over God. And sin's DNA is selfishness. It's self-centeredness. Now, the word that is uh, translated reconciliation there in uh, verse 18 and the other verses that mention that word, the actual word in the original language that the New Testament was written in, reconciliation means to totally change, to totally change. And it simply means that uh, God totally reoriented human life back to his original creative purpose. That is, back to a God-centeredness, straightening out the image that he made us in that got messed up when we sin and choose self over God. He has brought us back to himself, and he's done that one way through the cross of Jesus. Humans can only be brought back from their self-will to God's will by that. Look at what verse 21 says. This is amazing. There's no other religion on the planet that can come close to what our God has done for us. Look at verse 21. For he, that is God the Father, hath made him, that is Jesus, the Son of God, to be sin for us. Jesus, who knew no sin, God made him to be sin for us. Why? In order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's absolutely incredible. We're fallen sinners. We're self-oriented people. And what happened at that cross is God himself in a human body as a man takes our place and he pays our sin debt in full. And then he, and he does so by becoming sin for us so he takes our sin, and in place of that, he exchanges and gives us his righteousness. He imparts the righteousness of God to those whose sin he takes. What an exchange that is. And then the purpose that you and I, 
who become the recipients of this reconciliation that God made through Christ on that cross, that we become channels to bring others to God's original intention for mankind. That's what verses 18 to 20 is all about. We've been given a ministry of reconciliation, verse 18. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sin unto them. And he's committed that word of reconciliation, that message to us. Verse 20, now then, we, not only Paul, but all believers, are ambassadors for Christ. As though God was begging through us that human beings would be reconciled to God because of what Jesus did for them. In order to really be involved in this ministry of reconciliation as we're called to be, it requires that you become a new creation, that you become a new creature, as verse 17 says. And that's the only way you can effectively bring back others to God. That's the only way you can really be an ambassador. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is a representative of a king and a kingdom. We are ambassadors of the king of kings and of a kingdom that is eternal, that is everlasting. We're ambassadors. And we're to show, I guess you might say, as an ambassador would show, we're to show what life in heaven is like right here. We're to be living kingdom life while we're here in this body. And that is done by the fullness of the spirit. That is spirit-filled living. That is spirit-filled with the love of Christ. I read of a man that was deeply disturbed about his own sin. And so he wrote a famous preacher who himself had agonized much about his own sin. And he replied to the man, learn to know Christ and him crucified. Learn to sing to him and say, Lord Jesus, you're my righteousness. You took on you what was mine. You set on, on me what was yours. You became what you were not so that I might become what I was not. That's verse 21. That's the great exchange. He gets our sin. We get his righteousness. That's a great deal. That's the greatest transaction that a human being can ever experience. But notice that it is by faith, isn't it? It's a it's a, a hope that we have. It's a destination living. And then it's a representation living. It's that love of Christ through us. When Hudson Taylor was the director of the China England uh, Inland Mission, he often interviewed candidates for the mission field, and on one occasion, he met with a group of them, applicants that wanted to serve the Lord in China. And so he, he decided that he was going to test their motivations for ministry. And he asked them, why do you wish to go as a foreign missionary? And one of them said, well, I want to go because Christ has commanded us to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Another one said, I want to go because millions are perishing without Christ. And others gave different answers. And then Hudson Taylor said, well, all your motives, however good, will fail you in times of testing and trial and possible death. <laughs> There's but one motive that will sustain you in trial and testing, and that is namely the love of Christ. Paul said it was the love of Christ that compelled him. To go. A missionary in Africa was once asked if he really liked what he was doing. He was a missionary doctor. And he answered, you, do I like this work? He said, no. My wife and I don't like dirt. Uh, we don't like crawling into vile huts through goat manure. But is a man to do nothing for Christ that he doesn't like? God pity him if not liking or disliking, has nothing to do with it. We have orders to go. 
And we go because love constrains us to go. In response to a reporter's question, a missionary talked about the hardships of his work as a missionary doctor in a distant land. And probing the reporter said, why would an educated man like you dedicate his life to a work like that? And the missionary replied, because a man who loves God comes to love people that God has sent him to help. The skeptical reporter continued, but what other reasons do you have? The missionary said, none that I'm aware of. Later, the reporter said, well, I still don't know what makes a man like that tick. Everyone has an angle somewhere. Here's the angle. The love of Christ constrains me. The love of Christ is what compels me. The love of Christ is what grips me, holds me in, hems me in, and won't let me go because of the overwhelming love of God shed abroad in the human heart of the child of God. That's it. What motivates you? What motivates you to do what you do? And who are we really living for, ourselves or for the Lord? If he died for all, then that means that all believers should no longer henceforth live for themselves, but unto him that died for them. What motivates you? Who are you living for? Yourselves? Let's not kid ourselves. Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's be clear about this. You can't serve two masters. You're either living for yourself or you're living for Christ every single moment of every day.